Thank you very much. It's a, it's a huge honor to be here at this wonderful conference. Um, and I'd like to thank the, um, the organizers of the conference for inviting me. The talk I'm going to give is highly condensed, so if I stumble and splutter in the middle, it's because I'm trying to get through a lot of stuff. But there will be a written version of this paper available on the web after my talk. Um, let me begin with a very, very big question, which is what makes humans different? What makes our species different? What's the diagnostic feature of our species? It's a question that uh, scholars have struggled with for a long, long time. And I think the reason we've struggled with it may not be that it's so difficult, but that we approach it as specialists. And I think of ants on elephants. You know the story of the ants on the elephants. There are these ants meet on the elephant. And one of them says, it's gray, and it's wrinkly, and it's tough. And the other one says, not at all. It's white, and it's hard, and it's shiny. And the other says, yeah, well, I don't care about you, but what worries me is the damn thing keeps shaking, and I have to cling on, like, you know, to avoid falling off. It's terrifying. None of them can see the elephant. And that, I think, is the situation of scholarship on humanity. Paleontologists study early humanity. Historians study later humanity. Linguists study parts of the brain. We find it very difficult to see humanity whole. And the result is a series of... Uh, I don't want to sound unfair, brilliant, but essentially failed attempts to define humanity. Let me just look at some of them. Louis and Mary Leakey did wonderful work in Aldervai Gorge on early human history. And in 1964, they found the remains of a species that was associated with stone tools. And at the time, it was widely believed that you could describe humans as a tool-using species. And Louis Leakey seized on this, called the species Homo habilis, in other words, the first human, the first tool user. And the name stuck, it's still, it's still used. Um, unfortunately, their student, uh, Jane Goodall, who'd worked with them, and they encouraged to begin this fundamental work of studying primates in the wild, she was the person who showed what was wrong with this theory. And this is what she showed. Um, Chimps use tools. Here's a wonderful little graphic I picked off the web of Effie the gorilla using a stick to get across the swamp. Apparently, this is the first time a gorilla in the wild has been observed using a tool. Uh, crows apparently are brilliant at this. There's a wonderful David Attenborough. He's one of my heroes. David Attenborough clip of crows in Tokyo. And there's a particular hard nut, like a Brazil nut, uh, that they love, and they need to crack it. And you can't always crack it by dropping it from a height. So they sit at traffic lights. They wait till the light turns red, all the cars stop. They go down, they place the nuts in front of the cars. Then they wait for a complete cycle of the traffic lights. They come back, and they pick up the nuts. Crows are really, really clever. So man, the toolmaker, won't work. Um, what about man, the hunter? A 1969 collection of essays was called Man the Hunter. It was still a time when you, you could use a phrase like that. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> again, Jane Goodall and her colleagues showed that this doesn't work. Many other primates hunt. Uh, what about um, humans have a really rich interior emotional life? Yes, but when you see pictures like this, I don't know about you, but I cannot believe that these intelligent mammals do not have as rich an internal emotional life as I do. Capacity for love, for pain, for suffering. Um, only humans have language. I'm ashamed to say I've argued that in my time, um, but uh, it's completely wrong, of course. Uh, here's Coco the gorilla asking Penny for an orange. We now know that many species have language of some kind. Humans are exceptionally brainy. This is a very, very old theory. It goes back at least to the Enlightenment. Except that we've now discovered a species, Homo floresiensis, whose brains are about half those of a modern human, and yet whose technologies seem to be very close to those of Homo erectus, pretty good technologies. So none of these quite work. And I think the problem, as I say, is specialization. What we need is an ant helicopter. Let me explain. I have this fantasy that I could fly down onto the elephant 
and I could invite one of the ants to go on a trip with me. And we'd strap the ant in. I have no idea how you strap an ant into a helicopter, but we strap it in somehow, and then we lift off. And this is the conversation that I imagine. The ant says, wow, this is exciting. And there's my home wrinkle, and there's my cousin's wrinkle, and there's my enemy's wrinkle over there. And then the ant starts panicking, and it says, oh, I can't see the wrinkles. Where, where are the details? They've, 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 they've vanished. I can't see my home wrinkle. And it starts hyperventilating. And I have to say, calm down, breathe, let your eyeballs relax, and tell me what you're actually seeing. And this is what the ant says. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll try and do that. <sighs> wow, I'm seeing this huge gray thing. And in front, there's this huge, long, waggly thing. And either side of it, there are these white, pointy, spear-like things. And finally, it's seen the elephant. So we need a sort of ant helicopter. As a species, we discovered one form of ant helicopter in the 60s, um, looking at the Earth from space. This is another Kevin Kelly's wonderful book, Home Planet consists of pictures from space with comments from astronauts. Every astronaut and cosmonaut underwent the same epiphany. And this is just one example. This is Sultan bin Salman al Saud, the first Arab astronaut who flew on Discovery in 1985. And he says, the first day or so, we all pointed to our countries. That's the specialist vision. The third or fourth day, we were pointing to our continents. By the fifth day, we were aware of only one Earth. My own preferred ant helicopter is big history. I've been teaching courses in big history for about 20 years now. And what courses in big history do is look at the whole of the past, beginning literally with the Big Bang and actually ending many thousands, millions, billions of years in the future. And to give you some sense of what big history does and the role it can play as an ant helicopter, I want to give you a quick two-minute course in big history. <clears throat> It's going to consist of dates. So here, I'm going to go very quickly through them, but I'm going to go through them twice. The universe appeared 13.7 billion years ago, and there is a quiz at the end of this, by the way. Um, the Earth appeared 4.5 billion years ago. The first living organisms appeared about 3.8 billion years ago. The first multi-celled organisms about 600 million years ago. Notice that. It's late. Most of the history of life on Earth is a history of bacteria. The dinosaurs were wiped out by an asteroid impact. Walter Alvarez, who proved that, is now teaching big history at Berkeley, by the way. This really matters. If that asteroid had been on a trajectory five minutes earlier or five minutes later, the dinosaurs would still rule the planet. Our mammalian ancestors would not have, in, have evolved as they did. We would not be here. This is an important date. The first hominines, about seven million years ago, our species about 200,000 years ago, the first agricultural societies 10,000 years ago, the first civilizations and written documents 5,000 years ago. That's when my historian colleagues get interested. They say, David, why have you had to give us eight dates before this? <clears throat> and then the Industrial Revolution 250 years ago, and humans enter space 50 years ago. Now, Unless you're a geologist, you're probably not used to dealing with billions or millions, so an extra zero here or there gets kind of lost in the chaos. So let me run it past you again in a different format. I imagine we take the same timeline, we compress it by a billion. So we imagine that the universe was created 13 years ago, and we can all handle 13 years. And then I'll give you the same dates in proportion. And it'll be easier, I think, to get a sense of the relationship. The Earth would have existed for about five years. <clears throat> Large organisms with many cells, four. Anyone want to guess? I've left the figures blank for a moment, so you can try and guess. And I've given you plenty of clues. Uh, seven months. <clears throat> uh, the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs would have landed. Anyone want to call out a date? Three weeks ago. Um, the hominines would have existed for just three days, uh, our own species for 53 minutes, uh, agricultural societies for five minutes, uh, the entire recorded history of civilization for three minutes, 
the modern industrial societies for six seconds, and we would have entered space one second ago. One and two, that's a second, okay? So that's a way of putting human history in the context of big history. <clears throat> now, with that in mind, what I want to do is try and look at our species from the ant helicopter of big history. If we do that, what do we see? Well, this, I think, is what we see. We see this famous graphic of the Earth at night. And imagine yourself as a, uh, someone from an alien star system. You're flying through the solar system. You fly past this planet, and you see this. What do you think? It'll be hard to avoid the temptation to think that there's some huge volcanic event going on right across this planet. But in fact, we know this is the work of one species, one of billions of species. <clears throat> so if you knew that, you'd have to say there is on this planet a species with astonishing power. Now let me give you one or two illustrations of what I mean by that power. Here's a very rough graph of human energy use over different periods, beginning with the Paleolithic. And it's the final figure that interests me. We take all human energy use, we divide into it the population on Earth today. And we find that very roughly, each of us consumes about 230,000 calories a day. That is approximately 100 times what we need to survive. Now, how remarkable that is will be clear if you understand that every other species on this planet in 4 billion years has consumed slightly more than it actually needs, but no more than that. This is remarkable behavior on a scale of 4 billion years. Can I go back for a moment? I clicked too soon. Thank you. As a result of us consuming so much energy, we are now consuming, some people estimate, between 25 and 40 percent, or we're controlling 25 to 40 percent of all the energy that enters the biosphere through photosynthesis. We're one species of billions. We control that much. And if one species controls that much energy, then clearly there's less for other species. So it's no surprise that rates of extinction at the moment are estimated to be 100,000 times. Uh, sorry, a thousand times what they are in normal periods. In other words, they are on the same scale as rates of extinction during the greatest extinction events of the last 600 million years, including that asteroid impact. We're astonishingly powerful, and we're dangerously powerful. <clears throat> We've now figured out how to generate the sort of power that drives the sun. When J.R. Oppenheimer saw the first atomic test, the words of Vishnu from the Bhagavad Gita popped into his brain. Now I'm become death, the destroyer of worlds. We're so powerful that Paul Crutzen, a Nobel Prize winning climatologist, and some of his colleagues have argued that we have now entered a new geological epoch in the history of the planet, which he calls the Anthropocene, the period in which one species, human beings, dominates what happens in the biosphere. This behavior is unique in four billion years. We can be pretty sure of that because if other species had behaved like this, we would see it in the archeological record. In other words, that graphic of the Earth at night is describing the awakening of a new phenomenon in the four billion year history of our planet.